thank you for inviting me along today to speak about uh, Hill Forts on the Tay. Um, really, I think it's fair to say that there's been a resurgence of interest in Hill Fort studies in Scotland in the last decade or so. Um, and if you look back to things like Rampart Scotland by Murray Cook, that project, and of course there's the ongoing digital updating of Hogg's classic uh, 1979 Gazetteer of British Hill Forts, um, which is ongoing as the Hill Forts UK, British Isles and Ireland Atlas, uh, being led by uh, Edinburgh University and Oxford University. Uh, that's especially true, this kind of resurgence is especially true uh, in Tayside, largely as we'll see due to the work of the uh, SERF, the Glasgow University and Aberdeen University SERF project we heard about earlier today, and the work of Tessa Poller. Um, but this talk that I'm going to give at the moment is really going to give an update on kind of work over the last few years at Six Hill Forts uh, along the Tay from the loch all the way down to the sea. Um, uh, and really recent work that varies in nature from non-intrusive survey uh, interpretation through to you know, fairly large scale excavation, um, but there are common themes in there and the common themes really include uh, uncovering the past, physic physically and literally uncovering hill forts from vegetation, and also kind of uh, in terms of improving physical and intellectual access to these sites. Um, so the first slide we have on here, uh, many people will recognise this as being uh, Moncrief Hill from Newborough, taken in about 1910, something like that. Uh, it's not projecting brilliantly, but uh, in the forefront you can see the tea reed beds stacked there uh, on the foreshore at Newborough, ready to be used. Of course, quite an iconic image uh, in terms of the tea estuary. Uh, in terms of uh, excavation of hill forts in general, uh, Perth and Kinross uh, boasts some of the earliest excavations in Scotland, going all the way back to Playfair's excavations in 1799 on top of Dunstan and Hill Forts, followed in 18, 1854 by Nairn's excavations. And on this, you can see the large Playfair's massive trench across the top of Dunstan and uh, Hill Forts. Um, of course on the said laws and with those connections back to Macbeth, those early excavators were no doubt uh, tempted by Macbeth connections in their excavations, but they're really kind of, the excavations kind of indicate the kind of end of, uh, the end of treasure hunting into kind of the early scientific approach of, of archaeology. So hill forts are important in Perth and Kinross. Um, but really, the main, the, the main uh, kind of starting point is, is really, in many senses, uh, Christensen's report in PSAS 1900, which is the forts of Perth and Forfa and Concarnshire, etc. And brilliantly, it's really the first sort of uh, attempt at synthesis and trying to understand the group and looking at the morphology and the location and these kind of things. And uh, beautifully, he hints at the complexity of the subject by describing his work as a tolerably, tolerably exhaustive account. He kind of recognises that, you know, he's kind of putting out the bare bones of it, if you like. So uh, it remains a kind of standard starting point, as I say. Uh, in terms of the talk today, we'll look at Six Hill Forts. The first two of these are um, on the river north of Perth, uh, Cashel MacToothal uh, on Drummond Hill above um, Kenmore, King Seat at Dunkeld, and then a group of four hill forts that have been looked at through the Tay Landscape Partnership Scheme, which I know that you heard lots about last year from uh, Sophie Nicholl from Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust. Um, so looking at where these sites are, uh, up on Loch Tay, at the east end of Drummond Hill, overlooking the, the, uh, the Appen of Dull, um, Cashel MacToothal, on that fantastic bend uh, at Dunkel, just as you're entering the Highland Zone, uh, King's Seat. On the Sid Laws, Dukeney Wood, the twin hill forts of Moor Dun and Moor Creef, Moncrief, on Moncrief Hill, key position between, you know, overlooking both the, uh, both the rivers of the Tay and the Erne, and Abernethy Law, which is down in the Fife Ochels. So to look at the first one of these, um, Keishel MacToothal, 
Um, this is uh, Christensen's illustrations back in the 1800s. The site itself, the place name refers to the annals of Ulster record that Tuthel was a son of Artgus, who was the Bishop of Fortrua and the uh, Abbot of Dunkeld, who died in the in, you know, 8, 865. So there are historic connections to the site. Um, and I first visited the site uh, in, in 2003 when it had just been cleared out of forestry. So Paul, um, it, the Forestry Commission had removed much of the forest which had covered the site for a number of years. So this is how it looks in the first edition map. It's basically covered in forest. Um, this is how it appears in 2003 after that uh, clearance work. Uh, the fort's got that basic kind of shape. And, and, be, and soon after that clearance, uh, Perth and Kinross Countryside Trust worked on the reconstruction of it based on you know, the earthworks that had been revealed, etc., but in 2014, uh, the Forestry Commission Scotland, working with ourselves, um, and in this case, Eddie Martin, who, to use the drone technology for aerial photography, we took up the drone to take some low-level aerial photographs, which allowed us to map out in a bit more detail where things were appearing on that site. Uh, and along with some topographic survey that was carried out by Rubicon, uh, allowed us to transpose those onto, uh, onto that topography and to do some interpretation based on no, no geophysics, no excavation, etc. Lo just looking at the physical remains that survive there and to sort of bring that site to life in some way. Uh, so our second site, the King's Seat, it's a whole different story, and this is a case whereby uh, the trust was contacted by members of the local community in Dunkeld, who basically said, we have a hill fort that's totally overgrown and stuff, you can't get to it, you can't see it. And I was aware that the, um, the, the, local, the local historical society had been doing guided walks up there as part of Archaeology Month, year after year, and it's very difficult to access, etc. You'll know when you drive up the A9 and you see those crags, uh, um, it's actually on here, the mound to the left of the crags, that's where the hill forts are. Again, the familiar story now, if you can see that, but basically covered in trees in 1900, uh, still covered in trees now, and in fact the major threat to the site was actually uh, rhododendron uh, cover, dense rhododendrons, which just covered the entire thing, really literally. Um, so we look at the community group here, and the chap in the centre there is a, a, a guy called Dave McDougall um, from the local community who approached us and brought together a group of locals in the area who went up and done this incredible clearance work. And with thanks to Steve Ponsonby, who's in the audience, some pictures from Steve of that clearance work. So this is what it looked like if you tried to go into this hill fort a couple of years ago. And these are kind of the before and afters. So what they found when they cleared this site was this massive erratic boulder, a right? huge slab of uh, rock, which I think may be the king's seat. But uh, it's actually got lots of holes drilled in it as well, which is really interesting. Um, but these are, you know, this is the impact of a group of individuals who have just got together to do this. Really quite remarkable. And the Heritage Trust helped out with that in terms of getting permissions from Historic Scotland, etc., etc. Um, so that's really it. It's a hugely intriguing site. There are plans that were made by the uh, then Royal Commission back in the 60s. Uh, but that's already allowed us, in terms of Archaeology Month, to recently go back with the local community and do some more walks and talks. And this project's really been taken forward now by Sarah Malone, who's in the centre of that picture from the Heritage Trust, who many of you will know of. So moving on now to the hill forts of the T and the cluster of hill forts we were talking about through the T Landscape Partnership Scheme. The original idea of the T Landscape Partnership Scheme, looking at these uh, several hill forts around the T estuary, was really to kind of roll out the, uh, the kind of programme research that had been carried out by Cerf and Tessa Poller over a decade to the west down in Strathairn. And originally the idea was to look at small-scale excavation on a whole number of hill forts. But back in the development of that project, we came to the conclusion through discussion with a, a, a steering group we created with Ian Ralston and Steve Driscoll and various other people that, in fact, um, larger scale excavation at one key site would actually be more beneficial perhaps than putting lots of small trenches in lots of sites. There's lots of pros and cons here but that was really the steer we were given. 
Um, but really as a nod to Tessa's work in, in, in Strathern, um, people will know that there are you know, a, a huge number of uh, sites excavated, uh, you know, at least 10 hill forts over a decade uh, in Strathern, the notable ones being down at you know, Ben Effery, um, Castle Law, Forgandenny, um, you know, the knock at Dunning, etc. There's a whole range of them, and by collecting these carbon dates, um, you know, we're really bringing for the first time dates to sites, many of which have never been excavated at all. So, uh, it's answering one of the big questions there, which are, you know, are all of these sites contemporary? Um, you know, what, what's the phasing on them, both on individual sites, but as a whole group? Um, so that's how we ended up with the approach here of having a larger scale open excavation on Moncrief Hill, um, which is what we've been carrying out over the last couple of years and into next year. But before we go there and the update of that site, we'll, 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 we'll go back to Duchny Wood, Duchny Wood and I'll briefly explain here the now familiar picture of uh, a fort covered in trees in 1860. Um, the Forestry Commission had uh, uh, a couple of years ago, or, or uh, by, by about 2014, the, the, the first version had cleared the site of trees, but you'll notice it ended up as a kind of as an area inside a ring of trees. And access was very narrow through that little passage. You know, the, the, the impact of the trees had been removed, but it really wasn't accessible. Um, so, uh, Matt Ritchie at the Forestry Commission um, a few years ago. Um, looked at clearing away and you can see how the physical access to the site's been hugely improved. You know, from the path, you don't even have to go up there, you can see it's setting much clearer, etc. Um, and it's really, you can see this, it's quite an elongated structure, I've got this little um, thing here, but that's kind of how it may look there. So improving that physical access has allowed TLP to take a group of volunteers, this time with AOC Archaeology, uh, to go and to produce this this survey, you know, adding on to all the previous surveys, etc. But for this time, you know, one that's been created um, without the hindrance of the trees in the way. So moving on now to Moncrief and Mordun, the twin hill forts on Moncrief Hill, and you can see them there. Sorry, I don't have a pointer, but hopefully you can see at the top there a large Mordun hill fort, which is on the crown of the hill, and this old area over to the right, this shaped um, enclosure being the smaller Moncrief Hill. Uh, the sites are in one sense absolutely hill forts of the Tay. There's their setting in the estuary. You can see on the left the, the shallow uh, fast flowing Tay, the hill of nature, the Oxbowing urn over to the right and the key location that these forts have over both those rivers uh, really indicates their importance um, geographically uh, amongst the hill forts that lie on other sides, uh, on either side, both along the, the, the Ockles and in the Sidlaws. Um, but if we flip round and look the other way, and these are aerial photographs that I've been taking with Dave Cowley of Hess uh, recently, um, but these, these indicate that in many senses the hill forts are also very much hill forts of the Erm, and certainly Moncrief, the smaller one, and arguably the Citadel and Mon and Mordun are both concerned more with the uh, more with the Erm than the Tay. So quickly looking at Moncrief Hill Fort, um, when we looked uh, a number of years ago, um, we spoke with the then Royal Commission about surveying both of these sites. And at that time, there was a feeling that there was so little at, Mor at Moncrief that the there was a question as to whether there was even a hill fort there. Um, but we were sure that we wanted to have a look because um, it had obviously been mapped in the past. There were references to it, etc. Again, it's covered in trees back then. You can now see the centre of it again is cleared, a bit like Duchny Woods. Um, but what we carried out, first of all, was a geophysical survey by uh, Peter Morris, and that was followed up then by you know, relatively small-scale uh, trenching um, over a number of years, over two years on the site, which uncovered you know, fairly good evidence, both of um, bits of internal evidence and bits of rock-cut features, bits of walling, etc., and some ditches, external ditches, which had never really been identified previously. So with some relatively small-scale um, excavation, we managed to confirm not only the existence of a hill fort, 
the position of the rampart and, en and, one, and one entrance, but also the existence of two, if not three, ditches out with that. So, uh, again, basically quite a, a, a good turnaround, I think, in terms of our understanding of the site through really community archaeology. This is a kind of citizen science approach that the Trust has in all of its projects in terms of archaeological research involving the community in looking into these things. So, now on to more done, and we've carried out two month-long excavations at more done to date, and we've got a further month-long excavation uh, next April, which we're carrying out. And again, some of uh, our recent aerial photographs, which you can hopefully see here that there are a number of concentric and sort of, sort of concentric uh, enclosures on top of each other here. Um, and it's a big and complicated site. Go back to Christensen, this is his, uh, his, his drawing back in 1900s, and interestingly, uh, back at that point, the name takes on the name Karnak, and um, it just appears more done is, is kind of how it's referred to, the, the, the great fort, if you like. Karnak kind of appears around this time, and it may be part of a kind of designed landscape aspiration that the estate has. Um, because we also see things like the curling pond going in, we see lots of little pathways going up to viewpoints, etc., etc. And it may well be that the the Karnak name appears then as a kind of some kind of additional um, enticement to uh, the Victorian experience. Um, the site has largely been out with woodland, but if you look, I'll draw your attention to the group of trees over on the right hand side within the fort. And uh, it's really where it says more done top right now. And one of the things that Sophie Nicholl had arranged prior to excavation there was removal of quite a considerable number of trees from that part of the site, which had been uh, very inaccessible. And you can see the results straight there. You can see the line of the wall. You can see the entrance, etc. So again, we're looking towards improved management of the site and improved uh, visitor experience uh, at the site you know, from the off. Again, uh, large-scale geophysics over the whole top of the site, uh, both in terms of magnetometry and resistivity. Um, and you can see various features appearing here. This dark blue feature, a pond area sort of a system that we're excavating at the moment. You can see the central citadel, this... Um, heavily walled, small, aerated uh, central enclosure with hill forts out of, with other hill forts around about it. And this is our excavation plan at the moment in terms of some of the, the trenches we've been looking at. So I'm just going to briefly run into these and uh, update people on what we've been finding uh, in, in the last couple of years and particularly in September just past. So in the first year at Mordun, we looked at, uh, in terms of the research agenda, the nature and of the enclosure walls was one of our kind of objectives, both in terms of what, what were they like and also in terms of their date. So we put a rather large trench across both of, uh, both of these um, roughly concentric enclosures. Um, when I say it's a, it is a large trench, it's kind of you know, 30 metres long and it's sort of 4 metres wide, but when you put them onto this map, it suddenly brings home how big the site is. So really what we found in there was um, remains of, uh, you can see at the bottom of the slide, two, two, two uh, faces of, uh, of the wall with very little stone inside a large rocky area which is bedrock and very little remains of the outer enclosure. So it, it was kind of suspected, it was kind of confirming at least what we kind of were suspecting was that these were probably early in the sequence of hill forts on the hill and that they had been either largely robbed or perhaps they were, um, they were kind of sites that had involved as much earth as stone in their construction. Um, Here's the upper wall on that site, and you can see it's got a stone facade, but there was very little stone inside it, usual kind of size, you know, sort of three metres wide, etc. Um, we then looked at this annex, this northern kind of loop um, enclosure, and again we put on our trench, which seems dwarfed by everything round about it. And this was really interesting because in this instance, this is after excavation, and we've hollowed out all of the, uh, the hearting material, all the core material that the walls have removed. And it actually revealed that there was a, another phase of facing inside the wall. So the wall had been 
either extended or rebuilt in some way, which is really quite surprising in itself. But you can see straight away from the wall that it's a different, it's a far more formal expression of a wall. It's much more, um, it's built straight onto bedrock uh, and there's lots of coating material on there. Then in the citadel itself, we excavated a, an enormous wall in this trench here last year. Um, and the side, you can see the outer, uh, the outer face of the wall with these huge stones here. And that gives you an impression of the scale of these things. The wall's five meters thick at this point and at least two meters high. So it's a massive construction as kind of indicated on the plan. Um, and the final, the final sort of area that we've been concentrating on was this um, mound area, which a flat top mound identified inside the second uh, uh, set of enclosures, uh, which appears to run round and respect its location. And there was a lot of queries as to what, what was this mound about, etc. So in the first year, we put a trench round there just to find out what was happening. And the second year, we opened this up to look at, uh, and, and we, f we found the, the entrance to this enclosure. And really, just this is all kind of very kind of draft and literally hot off the press, but we th this is roughly what we think is going on. It's a roughly circular building, though we've yet to confirm whether it actually joins up with the, in the inner face of the hill fort enclosure wall or whether it was originally a freestanding building. Um, it appears to have, it appears to bulge out at the entrance and we want to confirm whether that's a kind of additional facade that's been added. Um, it's got quite a wide entrance, it's about two metres wide, which is kind of unusual. But it has a very thick, well, the, the wall is about five metres thick. So it's considerably thick wall enclosing a small area. We had wondered at one point whether this could be brock like um, it's certainly a building of with, you know, very thick walling, and uh, our, our future research will go back to look to see whether there are internal features, etc. But I think in terms of the building material at Moncrief, uh, the surprising thing was the amount of old red sandstone on this structure. Um, and I, I think it's unlikely to have been a, 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 despite the thickness of the wall, it's unlikely to be a, a tower of any height. It may well have had a height of, you know, in, in you know, four or five metres perhaps, but certainly not a, a full height broch as found at Castle Craig, where very locally there's a very good quality, almost Caithness slab type material to build with. Um, you can see the, 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 um, Coursing of, or the, uh, the terracing of the bedrock, winning material, creating a mound on which this building sat. And over on the right here, we actually found some of the pe pecking marks from the uh, from the, uh, the excavators. So these are just some general shots of that site. Really quite exciting. You'll see it at the top of the entrance here. You might be able to pick out a slightly kind of red area in there. And this had been picked up in the geophysics, and it, it may well be an area of vitrification. There's certainly been a very burned soil right in the entrance, and that's something that's really exciting us. But in the actual across the excavations there, we did find a number of cut mark stones that were some of which appear to have been on the bedrock at the site, which had been one and incorporated into the wall, and others which were perhaps brought onto site on other stones. Um, just some pictures of the entrance being revealed. As I say, two metres wide is kind of wide, certainly for brocks and things. The other thing, I don't know how clear this is, it's really quite an unusual, um, unusual construction and what appears to be quite a weak construction at the corners. So this is the corner, this is the outside face on the right, and there's almost a kind of diagonal, um, a diagonal uh, mix of stone on the entrance, which is the facade you see here, and the facade running to the side. Um, this may suggest that it's been rebuilt or added on to at some point, and that's what we hope to look at in the future. Uh, I'd mentioned the area of burning in the entrance. And, uh, you know, the site is slightly reminiscent in some ways of the Black Spout excavation which we looked at up in, in Pit Lockery a number of years ago, and it really features as part of really an ongoing programme of research we have in terms of, um, in terms of uh, Iron Age 
um, monumental architecture in, in the area. So the last trench here we're going to look at today was really uh, over these two um, suggested roundhouses. Uh, and again, they're in the surveys of this, the topographic surveys that have been suggested that these posts dated the, the, um, the large citadel wall. Um, and they've been picked up by a number of surveyors, and our excavations were really to see if we could enlighten. And there are certainly features there. At the moment, we're certainly not saying that they are definitely roundhouses, though. Um, and we need to do a little bit more excavation there, but we certainly didn't find, I think, what we were looking out to or what we suspected. What we did find was the outer wall, and you can just see it kind of appearing in these, uh, the, the facing stones either side here, of the citadel wall. And temptingly, these appear to have some kind of um, timber lacing kind of outer facade, as found at Abernethy Fort, as found at Castle Craig for Gundeni. Um, so that's one of our targets, certainly, for next year. We looked at the pond again I'd mentioned. In terms of artefacts, huge amounts of artefacts, we've got over 300 uh, finds from more done uh, at present and they range from all of the usual small amounts of pottery, all the usual kind of stone artefacts etc. Uh, lots of shale or um, uh, uh, bracelets including those which were partially being made so it seems like they're actually making those on sites. But Really quite a significant number of those, um, really quite nice things. And one of our star finds was this um, swan necked um, pin, Iron Age pin, which, um, of which there are relatively, I think there are only three known in Scotland, uh, but a type really you know, known throughout the kind of British Isles more, and Ireland more widely. Um, and really it's one of the few finds I, I'd say that would certainly suggest uh, an elite social class or you know a high status um, uh, kind of artifact in line with what the architecture su suggests we've got lots of saddle querns and other things like that but that would be something that would hint at uh, you know status uh, we also have um, Richard Tipping has been looking at the pollen in, in, is doing so at present and uh, that's a hugely important part of the story for us uh, in that we've got um, uh, peat nearby, which will uncover that wonderful story and be able to tell us exactly what the vegetation history is on the hill right over the period of hill fort construction. You know, so from roughly a thousand BC to a thousand AD, that's kind of what we're going to try and recreate that vegetation history. And hopefully, we will see things like lots of trees suddenly disappear, or you know, things start growing back, or you know, we'll be able to link together the, the vegetation and the archaeology from that. So very briefly, um, this is kind of the survey, and this is kind of what we're thinking might be going on. There's an initial fort, and there's this mound feature. It may be that they're contemporary, or perhaps the mounds even earlier, but they seem to be the first things in the site. Um, and then this fort seems to go around. It kind of, it kind of seems to respect the fact that the mound's there, and it does seem also potentially to skirt around the lower citadel. But equally, that's where there's quite a lot of cliffs going on, so it may actually be a nod towards the cliffs. And then at a later date, it may well be that the annex actually dates from the same time as the citadel. It's certainly got lots of stonework, which you know is unlike the, the uh, earlier two larger forts. Um, but really in terms of phasing, we're hoping to uh, in, involve some Bayesian analysis down the line once we get lots and lots of carbon dates from lots and lots of contexts in here. And again, this idea of our open area excavation is uh, really part of that. Um, so in terms of outreach, we're working with Smart Histories who are over with uh, our Heritage Trust stand there. And they're doing wonderful things in terms of these um, digital reconstructions. And I would encourage you to go and have a look at some of the other things that they've been working with on TLP. And really, kind of to the future, looking forward, Abernethy Hill Fort. People, of course, will know of it as the uh, famed excavations back in the, uh, uh, in the late 19th century that were written up. And there again is the timber, fr timber um, framed uh, rampart at Abernethy. And we've done some more survey work there, and we're in discussions with the landowner at the moment, and really we would like to excavate that, um, and hopefully in the future 
myself or more likely Sophie Nicholl will be along to tell you more about that. Um, so really just a thanks to all of our volunteers. We've got over 7,000 hours, which is an incredible amount of time um, for people to have involved themselves in this excavation. It's been a really remarkable thing and it's been a fantastic thing to be part of. So I'll leave it there for now. Thanks so much. Thank you.